Hi everybody, welcome to lecture number 9 of GG497 Geological Visualization. Today we're going to look at vaults and how they appear on maps and what they look like in cross-section. So I think we should start at the beginning and introduce ourselves to faults and the terms we use to describe them. So a fault can be defined as fractures in rock along which slip has taken place. So you get a lot of fractures in rocks, you can form joints as well as faults, but faults are different to joints in that faults are planes along which slip has taken place. So one side of the fault has moved relative to the other. Now this is a picture of some cliffs in Ogmore in South Wales. And hopefully you can see that in this sequence of sedimentary rocks, it looks like there's this thicker band of sandy material, which if we were to follow it along the bedding planes, it doesn't continue past this steep looking fracture. Okay. Instead, it looks like these coarser grain beds of sandstone. If we were to follow them along the bedding planes, they'd crop out further down it looks like they've been offset so this surface this bedding surface here looks like it's one of these up here so it looks like that this block of rock has been pushed down relative to this one so this is sort of an indicative exposure of a fault where we have these marker beds which we can join up and originally they would have just continued as sediments tend to do. But what's happened is since they've been deposited, these sediments, they've been faulted, a fracture has formed, and one of those fault blocks has slipped relative to the other. So faults can occur on all scales, they can even occur on micro scales, they can occur on outcrop scales like this, but then they can also occur on continental scales and this is probably the most famous fault in the world this is the San Andreas fault in California and the fracture runs for thousands of kilometers so some terms that we should know about then when we're talking about faults faults occur in response to a stress and a stress can be defined as a force applied over an area. So think of pressure. When you press down on something, you're stressing it. You're applying a pressure over an area. Strain then is the deformation or the, the change in size and shape of the material that you're applying the stress to. Okay, so we can apply force, we can apply a pressure to rocks and that and those rocks will accommodate that stress by undergoing strain. Okay, if we were to look at that relationship for materials graphically, here we've got, on the y-axis, we've got stress. So that's the force that we're applying. And the response of the material, the response of the rock, is plotted as strain on the x-axis. So when we first initially apply some stress, our rock can take up some of that stress by undergoing elastic deformation. So it'll, it'll strain, it'll change size or shape, but as soon as we remove that stress, as soon as we relieve the pressure on that rock, that strain will be reduced and it'll go back to how it was before we started stressing it out. Okay. At some point though, if we were to continue to apply stress, keep on stressing our rock, keep on stressing our rock, sooner or later we would reach that rock's elastic limit. Okay, and at that point any further strain that our rock undergoes will become permanent. Okay, so even if we were to, to apply so much stress that we passed this elastic limit and then remove that stress, those rocks would be permanently strained. They'd have been permanently have changed shape. Now what we could do is obviously keep continuing and applying our stress, keep applying our stress, keep applying our stress, until there's some point that that rock cannot 
accommodate that stress by undergoing any more ductile deformation. It can't just sort of bend or buckle and accommodate that strain. And instead its only option to accommodate any further stress is to undergo fracture, to snap, to break. Okay, and it's at this sort of regime where we apply the stress so much that we, we overcome the competence of the rock that we actually cause it to fracture. That's the sort of conditions that we start forming faults in. We can kind of show this in an experiment. Uh, in this video we've got a steel beam that we're applying a pressure to and you can see it slowly bow as it accommodates that um, stress by undergoing elastic deformation but then at some point the stress becomes so much that we overcome the competence of the rock and we cause a fracture to form and quite spectacularly you can see that along this fracture we get slip one block moves relative to the other okay so you can think of this experiment as um, what's happening when when we stress a rock in the crust and at some point we overcome its strength and it fractures okay so when we get one of these fractures forming in the crust like this we form a fault plane and that's a plane along which slip has occurred and we call the two halves of a fault plane different things one of them we call a foot wall block and another and the other we call the hanging wall block and the reason that we call these two um, these two blocks these words is that if you were to imagine um, back when we were forming our first ideas of geology uh, largely through mining when you drive a mine shaft through one of these faults the block with which on which you'd be standing would be called your foot wall black football block and the block to which you'd hang your lamp that would be the hanging wall block so whenever you're looking at a fault in cross section until you can clock which one is a foot wall and a hanging wall block I'd recommend just drawing one of these mine shafts within it to show which one is a foot wall block and which one is the hanging wall block okay so that's what that's how faults form that's what the terms that we use to talk about faults and this is how we distinguish different parts of the fault from the fault plane the foot wall block and the hanging wall block okay there are generally there are three types of fault when we pull our rocks apart like when we put them under tension at some point that that stress that tension that we're putting our rocks will overcome the strength of the rock and they'll have to fracture and when that happens we tend to form normal faults and normal faults are ones where the hanging wall block has gone down relative to the foot wall block okay we're pulling these rocks apart we form a fracture where the hanging wall block has, has moved down relative to the foot wall block. Okay, now generally these normal faults have a dip of about 60 degrees. The fault plane itself has a dip of 60 degrees. And this sets them apart from compressional faults, where when we uh, force our rocks together, when we squeeze them, when we compress them, at some point we overcome the strength of that rock and cause it to fracture and we form what we call a thrust fault and a thrust fault is one where the hanging wall block has moved upwards relative to the foot wall block so you can see in normal faults the hanging wall block has gone down relative to the foot wall but in thrust faults the hanging wall block has moved up relative to the foot wall block and thrust faults generally or tend to have a dip of 30 degrees and the third type of fault these shear faults where we move where we move a portion of the rock one way and, and, and the other portion of the rock the other way so we kind of shear them we tend to form strike slip faults 
Okay, where we have, rather than have one block move up or down relative to another, the two blocks move past each other, they move laterally. Okay, we call these faults strike slip, and these strike slip faults tend to be vertical. Okay, so normal faults, hanging wall block moves down, the fault plane has a dip of 60. Thrust faults, the hanging wall block moves up, they tend to have a dip of 30. And in strike slip faults, you tend to have lateral movement and the fault planes are vertical. So to figure out why this is, why we get these different types of fault with these different geometries, um, scientists did some fracture experiments in order to understand why fault planes have these characteristic dips. And the experiment they built involved having cylinders of rock which were wrapped in a metal jacket which allows that rock to, to have a confining pressure. And then a piston would press down on that cylinder of rock on its exposed ends to apply a pressure, to apply a dominant stress parallel to the length of the core. So if in a, imagine in a, in a picture like this, this is the, um, one of the cores before it went into an experiment. And what they're going to do is use a piston to push the rocks from side to side. So they're applying the principal stress, the main compression down the length of the core. And this is the sort of stress regime that you tend to get in a continental um, convergence zone. So imagine this is the Himalayas where you've got the uh, Indian plate and the Pacific plate and they're pushing together. The principal stress is oriented kind of horizontal, like laterally. Okay, so they applied that stress to the rock and they found that the rock formed fractures with this consistent pattern. They formed these two fracture sets with an intersecting angle of 6120. Okay, so if we take those lines back off, we've got these are our fault planes that have um, where the slip has, has taken place on these. This is where the fracture has happened. And you can see that the dip of those fault planes is about 30 degrees. Okay, so just like in the previous slide where we looked at uh, thrust faults formed by compression, when we actually uh, do a sort of uh, a mini experiment compressing our rocks laterally like we would in a um, continental convergence zone, we form these thrust features that have a dip of 30 degrees. Okay, so then imagine that we did that experiment again, and this time we try to replicate the uh, stress regime that we might find in an extensional zone like a mid-ocean ridge where, where plates are moving apart. Well, the plates are under tension, they're pulling apart. So the dominant stress, the dominant compression in, uh, in a, a, a rift like this is actually up and down. So with our piston experiment, what we're going to do is, a pl is apply um, pressure vertically, just like we would be in a mid-ocean ridge setting. And again, we form these conjugate fracture set set. Uh, f we form these conjugate fracture sets, which, if we take a dip and strike on, we see are sixty degrees. So, in these extensional settings like rifts, we tend to form normal faults that have a sixty degree dip, and this is sets them apart from thrust faults which we tend to form in continental conversion settings or conversion settings in general where we form thrust faults with a 30 degree dip. Okay so let's have a, a look at a few pictures and try and understand what we've got. Here is a picture of some Triassic rocks from Barry Island near Cardiff. And you should be pretty happy that we can link up, there's this thin bed of paler material, which if we've got a thin bed, a thick bed, and another relatively thin bed, 
we can match them up on this side of the fracture. So we've got our thin bed here, thicker bed and thin bed, and then over here again. So these beds, this one would have joined up with this one, this one would have joined up with this one, and this one with this. And obviously they don't anymore because of this fracture. We've had a fault where slip has taken place. So having a look at this picture, what would we label as our as our sides? Imagine if we were to drill a little mine shaft in there and hang a lamp on it. What would we call the different components of this of this outcrop? Well, hopefully you can see that this is our fault plane. And if we were to have a mine shaft in here, we'd be stood on this block, this would be our foot wall. And in our mine shaft, we'd be hanging our light on this one, making it the hanging wall. Now, that's what we've named our rocks. And what is our sense of movement? Well, if we find ourselves a marker bed, for instance, this one would have joined up with this one. We can see that the only way that we can get this exposure to happen is if the hanging wall has moved down relative to the foot wall. Now, if we go back to that previous slide, if the hanging wall has moved down relative to the foot wall, then we classify this fault as a normal fault. That's pretty cool because if this is a normal fault, then what it tells us is that since these rocks were deposited in the Triassic, then this region, this bit of South Wales, has undergone a period of extension where the rocks have been under tension and they've pulled apart, they've fractured, and then they've slipped. Okay, so there's a period of extension that's affected South Wales since the Triassic. Okay, what about this one? This is uh, somewhere warmer and sunnier than than Barry. But again, you can see that we've got the same stratigraphy either side of this very obvious fracture. We've got these orange rocks and then this this bed of softer shaley material and then this bed of more competent probably sandstone. Here we've got the brown material, the the shaley stuff and then the more competent sandstone and you can follow these beds along this bed should continue up like this but it doesn't instead it's been dropped down here and it's been stopped by this fracture so again if we were to draw our little mine shaft in here let's draw our mine shaft with our cursor we'd be stood on the foot wall and we'd hang our lantern off the hanging wall so in this example, our hanging wall has moved up relative to our foot wall. We can tell that by looking at um, one of our marker beds, marker horizons, that we can follow either side of the fault. We can see that the hanging wall has moved up relative to the foot wall, and that sort of movement where the hanging wall has gone up, we call that a reverse, or that's indicative of a reverse or thrust fault. Okay, let's dive a bit deeper into the sense of slip. We've, we've figured out how we can tell apart different types of fault and broadly say something about the stress regime, whether it's um, tensional or whether it's compressional. But let's have a little look more at um, how we talk about the sense of slip. Okay, well, a fault plane will have a net slip, like a, a total uh, amount of movement and direction of movement, which will allow you to, to take into account what that fault has done. And in order to calculate the net slip, we need to find two points on either side of the fault plane that would er originally have been contiguous. So this point before the fault had happened would have sat on top of this point and the separation between them now after the fault has happened that total separation is called the net slip 
Okay, quite often though we can't have a fault plane in um, three dimensions. Usually we might just have a cliff or a cross section that, that we can see a fault plane on. Like for example, here we can only see this in a cliff, we can't see the full three dimensions. So we don't know if the hanging wall has, has moved down and back into the page, or if it's moved down and forward, or some combination of them. So instead of thinking about net slip, we tend to uh, think about, in cross-section anyway, the dip separation. So the amount of separation between two points on a fault plane along the fault plane itself. So if we have a look at this block diagram, you can see this green bed would have continued with this green bed prior to faulting. And the amount of dip slip is, let's take it as being the top of the green contact on this hanging wall side of the fault, would have been continuous with the top of the green um, rock on the fault wall side of the fault. And that distance between them along the fault plane, that's our dip separation. Now in order to calculate this depth separation um, we need to have drawn our cross section perpendicular to the um, strike of the fault. If we don't do that then what we're seeing on the fault plane is an apparent dip which is always less and so our dip separation will also be less. So we need to be aware of this apparent dip problem. The component of that dip slip, which is pure, purely vertical, so the dip slip would have been when this point, if we could join it up along the fault plane to there, the component of that dip slip that's purely vertical, we call that the throw. And the horizontal component of that dip slip, we call the heave. Okay, so the amount of um, horizontal distance that that rock has, has moved effectively. We call that the heave and we, we call the throw the amount of vertical. Okay, so in this example uh, that we've just looked at, our hanging wall has moved down relative to our foot wall. So this is a, another example um, of a normal fault. while the reverse fault is shown by the hanging wall moving up relative to the foot wall. Another way to tell them apart in cross-section is with normal faults, where the hanging wall has moved down, you don't get any repetition of the stratigraphy as you go downwards through the fault. So for example, if we were to, if we were to drill through this fault, we'd go through the blue bed, we come out the other side and then we never see it again. But in reverse faults, if we were to drill downwards through the fault plane, we'd see the blue bed, we'd come out of it, we'd cross the fault and then we'd see it again. So we get this um, repetition of the vertical of the stratigraphic sequence. Okay, so that's faults in, in cross-section. And then let's have a little look at their representation on maps. And on maps, faults are typically recognized by offsets in the outcrop patterns of rocks. So here we've got this sequence of carboniferous limestones and millstone grit. And you can see that this boundary between the millstone grit and our carboniferous limestones you can see as we follow it along strike it's been offset so these thickly dashed black lines there are faults and if a fault is really big it's a big deal then it'll usually have a name attached to it so for instance this one is the unthank fault okay because it's had a good few hundred meters of of displacement you can see from here to here they would have been originally joined and if each grid square is a kilometre, then that's probably about 700 metres of, of movement.
Okay, so we also kind of describe faults in terms of their sense of movement and strike separation. So on, on this map, for example, you can see that if we follow the strike of the limestone bed, you can see that we've got that offset. Yep. And we call that offset between two points along the strike of a fault, we call that the strike separation. And we can measure that directly off the, um, off the map. Now you can imagine if you were stood on this on this marker bed and you were looking across the fault plane it would look like the bed across the other side of the fault plane had been shifted to the left like it would have it would have been slipped over to the left and when we have that sort of sense of movement we say that the sense of movement for this fault is sinistral and that's where, when you're stood on a marker bed looking across a fault plane, it looks like the movement has been to the left. It's been, it, it's got a sinistral sense of movement. If we were in this example, where if you were to stand on a marker bed and look across a fault plane, and it looked as if the beds on the other side of the fault plane had moved to the right, then we'd call that dextral. So that's what those are the terms that we use when we talk about the sense of movement. So in this example, you can see that um, along this this fault here, which is the the skeleton fault, we have these dipping beds that are dipping over towards the the northeast. And you can see that if we were stood on one of these beds looking across the skeleton fault, whether we'd be stood here looking this way or stood here looking this way, it would look like our beds had been shifted to the left. So the sense of movement for the along the skeleton fault is sinistral. Now this is where it becomes slightly um, necessary to think about faults in 3D, even when we're looking at a map. Because if we just looked at the map, we might be tempted to say that, well, I mean, it makes, it makes sense that the, these two blocks have moved laterally relative to each other. It looks like um, this block has moved down to the left and this one has, has moved up in, in this direction. So it looks like that this fault might be purely a shear fault, a strike slip fault. Okay, if we were to only think of it in two dimensions looking at the map surface, we might interpret the skeleton fault to be strike slip. However, we also get this apparent outcrop pattern, this apparent strike separation using one of our dip slip faults. We can get this sort of strike separation if we if in fact this fault would be a normal or a thrust fault. Okay? So to try and demonstrate that on the next page we have a we have a block diagram which tries to show a normal fault where the hanging wall block has moved down relative to the foot wall block and you can see that if we were to have a normal fault we could on the map surface have an exposure pattern that looks like it would be a strike slip fault. We can get this strike separation in beds by having a dip slip by having a normal fault. Okay, so if the strike of the fault plane is equal to, like the strike direction of the fault plane is equal to the dip direction of the beds, then we end up with this apparent lateral slip in map view. Okay, it takes a little bit of time to wrap your head around. 
and you know if you have to close your eyes and kind of move your hands to figure out how different parts of the fault would move then that's fine I still need to do that from time to time but you can you can hopefully you can see from this di this block diagram that even if we have a dip slip fault like a normal fault if the strike of that normal fault is the same as the dip direction of the bed then on map view we will see an apparent lateral slip okay it's, it's, it can be quite confusing but you know see if you can wrap your head around what I want you to at least take away from this is just because on a map you might see lateral slip doesn't necessarily mean that that fault is is purely strike slip there might be um, a dip slip component to it in fact there, there probably is you can't just go on this strike separation to diagnose your fault okay so if we change the orientation of our fault and if we have our fault plane to be uh, the strike of our fault, fault plane to be perpendicular to the um, direction of dip then what you can see is we can uh, form a repetition of the stratigraphy. Imagine this part of our block diagram before the fault happened would be would join up with this black band here but by forming this um, dip slip fault where the strike is perpendicular to the dip direction we can form this repeated stratigraphy. Okay so sometimes the dip of the fault is difficult to figure out from the map and it's usually because the mappers maybe had very little clear evidence usually faults that they tend to make rock weaker so when you see them in the landscape there's just sort of a break in a break in slope or some sort of gully that you can't really measure a dip off it's it's just it's just there you know it's there so if we have to draw a cross section through a fault we're going to have to somehow figure out what the orientation and sense of movement along that fault is going to be okay sometimes along a fault there'll be a little tick and that tick is pointing at the side which has been thrown down it's not it is absolutely not telling you the dip direction of the fault plane like this um, picture of this map here it's not telling us that the fault plane itself is dipping towards the north it's telling us that the north side of the fault is the one which has moved down that's the block which has been down thrown Okay, it can look confusing because this tick, it might look a little bit like the, the dip tick you see on a bedding reading. But when you look at the key, you can see that these faults, whenever we see this tick, it actually means that the cross mark is on the side which has been thrown down. The other thing to be aware of is that on faults, even if it's a thrust fault or if it's a normal fault so even if it's compression or tension completely different faults they'll usually be given the same symbol and that's because the mapper didn't necessarily have um, enough data to figure out what sort of fault it was because again it was just a gully or a divot in the landscape that they wouldn't be that they weren't able to, to, to join up a marker bed either side So when we see a fault on the map like this where we're looking down top down we see this we see the fault trace has been has been mapped and we the the mappers have said that this is the down thrown side in order to figure out what sort of fault we're dealing with we really need to know what the dip of the fault plane is right because right now we could have a fault that's dipping this way, we could have a fault that's dipping that way and all we know is that this side of it has been thrown down. So option A, which would fit all of the information we've got so far, could be that this is a reverse or a, a thrust fault which is dipping in this direction 
with um, this side as being the one that has been thrown down. Or we could also have a normal fault, which would give us, uh, which would fit the, the information just as well. We're down throwing this side, but our fault plane is dipping in the opposite direction. So in order to answer this question and figure out which type of fault we have, we need to be able to estimate its dip. Okay? And can any of you guys remember from watching these videos so far how we've estimated the dip of planar features like faults? Well, maybe what we could do is build us some structural contours. So why don't we have a little look at how that might work in, in, in an idealized situation. Here we've got a fault plane which has offset this contact between the yellow and the blue unit. You can see that offset here. And we know that our rocks are dipping because they're crossing the, the ground contours. And we know that our fault plane is dipping because it's crossing the ground contours. We know it's not perfectly vertical because it isn't like a nice sort of linear feature. So it's got a dip to it that hopefully we should be able to measure. So the first step with all of our structural contour exercises so far has been to find the intersections where we know the height of the fault itself. And then by joining those points of equal height, we can build these structural contours. And from doing this, we can figure out what the strike of the fault plane is. We can figure out what its dip direction is by going from high to low um, in the structural contours. And then what we can do is use Pythagoras or trigonometry to work out the angle of dip. So we could get the dip direction, we could get the amount of dip, and then that's everything that we need to know in order to first of all plot it on our cross section and to figure out whether it's a normal or um, thrust fault. However, if we're lazy though, we can, we can use the outcrop patterns of the faults to make an estimate of their dip. So like a, like a real estimate. Okay, so for example, you remember that when we looked at this, this slide a few, um, a few slides ago, generally normal faults, they have a 60 degree dip. Generally thrust faults, they have a 30 degree dip and strike slip faults have a 90 degree dip, they're vertical. So on a map, a strike slip fault, its map trace would be perfectly straight. It wouldn't bend or get deflected by the contours. A 60 degree fault, a normal fault, that's ma their map traces tend to be straight-ish because they're still pretty steep. Not quite vertical, but they're still pretty steep. While our reverse faults tend to be curved. And that's because their dip is relatively low at 30 degrees. They tend to be curvier across the landscape. So, looking at this fault, looking at these sets of faults, these faults aren't perfectly linear. They, the mapper has already said that there's a downthrown side to it. So it looks to me that these guys would be normal faults. Okay, so if I, if I were to be drawing this as a um, in cross section. Then I'd have, then I'd be confident in calling these normal faults with a dip amount of 60 degrees. With these being the hanging wall blocks having moved downwards, that's how I'd um, draw it if I if I wasn't willing to draw structural contours to answer the question. Okay, so why don't we move on to an example where we draw a cross section through some of these faulted rocks. Let's have a little look at this map area and what you can see is that we've got some um, 
uh, tilted rocks that have a dip of somewhere between 40 degrees, 35, 44 degrees, something like that. And along our cross section, we cross these stratigraphic boundaries and also we cross faults. Okay, well, what I do is use my strip of paper and mark on all of my geological contacts. Maybe I'd use red to show the stratigraphic contacts and then blue to show the faulted ones, just to tell them part on my cross section. Then I colour in the surface outcrops as a thin veneer along my uh, cross section panel or otherwise label them. Then I'd annotate it with my um, bed info so these guys are they're all kind of dipping at sort of 35 ish degrees a little bit something like that I mean if I wanted to I could I could work out an average or I could or I could add some flexure to my to my cross section but right now I'm just going to take a, an average of about 35 and then I'd work out or estimate what the angle of dip of my fault planes is going is going to be so how would I do that? Well, based on the fact that there are some ticks, that tells me that the geologist has found that these faults have dip slip. So we can rule out these being purely strike slip faults because there's, there's an element of dip slip. It's not just lateral movement. So that means that I have a choice between normal faults or thrust faults. And I've noticed that these faults, they have very straight or pretty straight um, traces across the landscape, which indicates that they're very steeply dipping. So it's a very steeply dipping fault with a dip slip component. So if I take all of that into account, I can rule out strike slip faults because they've got a dip slip component and based on the balance of probabilities from our fracture experiment the type of fault that is most steeply dipping that has a dip slip component is a normal fault. Okay so if these faults are normal faults then our next question should be what is the direction of dip of the fault plane okay if you think about this for a minute these faults are normal faults we've got a dip tick to show which side has been thrown down for all of those things to be accounted for what must be the direction of dip of the fault plane Well, the only possible configuration based on these in uh, based on these interpretations is if the fault planes were dipping in the direction shown by the blue arrows. If we go back to our picture of our normal fault, you can see that the, the direction of dip of the fault plane is pointing towards the hanging wall block and it's the hanging wall block that has moved down. Okay, so going back to our map, you can see these ticks are pointing, if these are normal faults, they're pointing at the hanging wall block. And that picture of the normal fault shows that the dip, that the, the, the slip surface, the fault plane in normal faults is also dipping towards the hanging wall block. So in order for these for these faults to work as normal faults, these must be the directions of dip of the fault plane. Okay, so now what we can do is annotate the strip with this data and say that the this fault down here is dipping at 60 degrees kind of this way. And these two, um, based on the, the direction of text, must be dipping into each other like this. <coughs> 
And at this point we can now start plotting our, our section. So because our rocks are, are flat, um, sorry, because our rocks are dipping, we don't really need to draw a topography because we only do that when our rocks are boring and horizontal. So what I can do is drop my geological um, contacts onto my cross-section panel. And then I can shade the top part of my cross-section to show what the rocks would be on the surface very thinly, just that top little layer. And then I plot my youngest features first. So in this case, all of my rocks, all of my sedimentary rocks must have been there already in order to be faulted. So the faults must be the youngest things. And then I'm going to plot my faults on the map. Like if I was doing this properly, then because I've got an apparent dip issue, I'd, I'd recalculate what the angle of faults is. But right now I'm just going to get them on my, my cross section. Then what I can do is after I've plotted my youngest things on this map, I can pop on my um, geological contacts and show where they'd go in the subsurface, remembering that these rocks, um, they're, they're older than the fault. So when the fault has come along, we would have uh, cut them off. We would have truncated them because there's slip happening along these faults. The rocks are going to have to get to them and then stop. Then what I can do is colouring everything that I'm sure of. So right now, yeah, I'm sure between that bedding plane and the fault there's nothing else. I'm sure about that one and I'm sure about that one. Then what I can do is turn to my stratigraphic column. And based on the thicknesses in the stratigraphic column, like for instance beneath this, this MMG between this um, Triassic Mercia mudstone group. I've got this sandstone and I know what the thickness of the Mercia mudstone group is so what I can do is dot on um, where the where the sandstone would be and, and, and dot in the margin there. Here this purple unit is this WH is this Whitby mudstone formation and I know that that's pretty thin and just under it there's going to be the Cleveland ironstone formation then the states formation and then I'm back into the red car mudstone and then under that red car mudstone that I'm seeing at the surface here close to B sooner or later I'm going to get into this PNG unit and then back into the Mercia mudstone group so using the thicknesses on the stratigraphic column I can estimate where the stratigraphic boundaries in this rock section would be Then what I can do is annotate my cross section to show the sense of displacement. So which sides of the faults have moved relative to the others. And then I can project my rocks sensibly above the surface to show the effect of erosion. Remembering as well to take into account the movement of, of the faults. Then it's just a case of adding in a, a scale and a key, and then what I've got is my finished, my finished cross section through the area. Okay, how do we compare to the actual geological section for this area? Let's put the two side by side, and you can see that we're, you know, not too far away. We've got the main elements. We've got this stratigraphy sorted out we've got these normal faults and we've got this whippy mudstone group with the hidden stratigraphy beneath it that's bounded by these two faults here so i think we can be pretty happy with with our cross section so far we've got the dip of the rocks and we've got the faults in more or less the right orientations and if we were to take our time with this, making this as accurate as possible, then once we've got our cross section drawn, then what we can do is using our cross section, estimate all of the different types of displacement. So we can figure out what the dip slip
component is as well as the heave and the throw which is why it why it really pays to take the time with your cross section and draw it as accurately and precisely as possible okay so now what you can do is crack on with practical number nine where you look at a really impressive fault called the mere fault on the win canton sheet and I'll do my best to talk you through how to attack that lab in the next video. Uh, thanks for listening. I'll um, see you in the next video in a few minutes. See you guys.